Well, all right, here we are once again. This is Pastor B's kitchen table. This is the place we break it down, chop it up, and put it back together again. As you probably can see, I'm in a different place. I'm not in the studio today. I am literally at my kitchen table. And at this kitchen table, I'm so glad to have a guest. The first guest at my kitchen table in my home, it is Judge Tamika Carter. Judge Carter, welcome to the kitchen table. Thank you so much for having me, Pastor. I appreciate it. Yes, indeed. Judge Carter, uh, we are talking this month about Black family issues, things that are pertinent to our community, so they involve all families, but especially our community, our communities of people of, of African descent. And I wanted to have such an honorable judge as yourself here today to be able to talk us through some issues that we are facing and we can get some perspective about the criminal justice system. Uh, yes. The first thing, I, third thing I've got to ask you, I know that and in fact, you have a long litany of credentials and you've served on, on both sides of the aisle, uh, criminal justice and for defense counsel, you've been in the DA's office. Uh, what has been the biggest adjustment from going from one of those sides of the aisle to actually sitting on the bench? So the biggest difference is um, the role that you're playing, kind of what your duties are. So I, like you said, served uh, a lot of my career as a prosecutor. And when you are a prosecutor, you're representing the state of Texas. You represent the interests of victims. Um, so that is your that is your main purpose. Although ensuring that defendants' rights are not violated, because as a prosecutor, that's always your job. Um, but when you are a defense attorney, you are obligated strictly to your client. And so when I served in that role, that was the, those were my limitations. I am here to protect the interests of this individual charged with a crime. When you're a judge, you're the referee. You're to make mm -hmm. sure that both sides are uh, following the rules and that the person charged, um, that they are getting their rights protected. Um, but also you want to consider public safety and victims, crime victims as well. And so mm -hmm. as a judge, you're balancing it all. And that's why I think this conversation is so important because people often forget that when we say uh, criminal justice system, that it involves many players. And mm. so from the onset, you do have law enforcement, you have police officers making arrests, detectives investigating. But then once you get to the court, you have judges who are administering justice. You have the prosecutor. So the district attorney's office, you have defense attorneys, you have post-conviction prisons, you have the probation department. So wow. when we're talking about our criminal justice system, everyone has a role and there are multiple players in this. Wow, that is so, so comprehensive because many people don't think about that, but there are so many different entities, so many different tentacles involved in the criminal justice system. I like how you phrase that. So, so one of the questions has to be, did you just wake up one day and just decide you want to be a judge? How did you go into this whole now sitting on the bench wearing the robe. What was that yeah. pathway for like you, for you? So when you um, start out, I knew in law school that I was gonna be in the, the criminal field, right? I, okay. Those are the, that was my interest. And so when you're working as a prosecutor, you're in court almost every day if you're in a busy county. So I worked in a couple of different counties. My last um, county I did, Harris County, also in Fort Bend County. I'm in court every single day, so I'm before judges. And I see some of the good and I see some of the bad. And yeah. so when you wanna be a part of the change in the system, remember the system is a lot of different players. Um, I wanted to then now bring my talent and bring my passion to this role because I saw that some of the changes that need to happen with how people are treated in a courtroom, mm. it's controlled by the judge. And so if you want to bring a change to that area, you're gonna to have to start having some new voices, people with different perspectives and different backgrounds to serve in those roles. And so I dedicated over 10 years of my career to prosecution, several years in defense, gained that experience, and I'm able to bring all that with me to the bench so that when I have people in my courtroom, I've been on both sides. So I know what yeah. it means to be the prosecutor. I know what it means to be the defense attorney and the importance of all the roles. And so for me, um, just my path was I wanted to learn as much as I can about the function of the courtroom, about the law and all the people involved in it. And I did that working uh, before I ran for judge. Amazing. <laughs> Here at the kitchen table, we actually have a judge. Praise God for that. Judge, judge Carter, you were talking about the criminal justice system. Now we've all been, we've heard and we've read and we've witnessed as well. There seems to be a disparity. I remember Michelle Alexander wrote a book entitled The New Jim Crow about the age of mass incarceration, especially for blacks and brown. 
So my question to you, since you've been on both sides and you now sit as a, as a sitting judge, um, is there any validity to the idea that there's a disparity among incarceration for blacks and browns? So unfortunately, we, I think that we can't deny that that's true. Um, it, it does largely depend on where you are. I think we've done a lot better in some of the larger cities that are electing new uh, judges. Their benches are more diverse. Uh, if you look mm -hmm. at a Harris County, a Fortman County, a Dallas County. But unfortunately, when you go to some other parts, and I'll just limit it to Texas, in some of these other counties where judges are maybe a lot older, they've been on the bench for 30 and 40 years, and it's not um, a diversity of race, experience, culture. Um, and those situations, sometimes you really are seeing a disparity in sensing, unfortunately. And I think it's largely because they don't, they don't share maybe the same beliefs that um, mm. in, in reforming our system. They right. um, sometimes subscribe to that old notion of just lock everyone up and and what we've learned over time is that that is not a way to really eradicate crime. I and mean, we've been locking people up since this country was founded. And that's not stopping crime. That's not deterring crime. Um, but sometimes, unfortunately, some groups just believe that's the only answer. And, and that's what they subscribe to. So that's why it's important to, again, have different voices in the courtroom, different voices on the bench, different backgrounds. And so then you look at the whole person in front of you. And look, maybe, you know, consider taking a different approach because the old way is just not working. Mm, okay, man. Great answer. Judge Carter, I'm going to ask you a question that I know many of my viewers uh, are thinking. And the question is, is there a disparity in the, in the criminal justice system when it comes to economics? What role uh, does having resources or access to resources play in the criminal justice system? So again, unfortunately, we cannot deny that th there is to, to, a, to a degree, and, and this is a little more complicated because sometimes when we hear about, let's say court appointed attorneys, mm -hmm. they get a bad rap, but the, nowadays, a lot of attorneys who take retained clients, meaning clients mm -hmm. who pay them, they're right. also taking court appointed attorney, court appointed cases. And uh -huh. so there you, you do, there are good attorneys on the court appointed list. And as judges, mm -hmm. we screen those attorneys. Um, mm -hmm. So I do think that if you if you are able to retain an attorney and you have resources to hire experts, to hire your own investigators, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it feels like you get better representation, um, but we really do have good attorneys on the court appointed list, but there is no denying that in some counties, again, depending on where you land, what court you're in, who you are, who is appointed to your case, sometimes, unfortunately, some of those attorneys don't put in the same effort that mm. they would for another client. So it really is, I don't wanna give a blanket, all appointed right. attorneys are bad. You know, if you're low income, you can't get a good attorney. I don't wanna say that, but unfortunately it really is case by case. There are some uh, instances where people are not treated the same because of where they come from. And it, and uh, two, it, it, it feels like um, a lot of it is due to also not feeling like they have a voice. Right. Um, Sometimes we don't have people speaking for the underserved community. And so if you have someone with means who is mistreated, they, they're going to have advocates speaking on their behalf. Well, if you don't, you may not. And so that also plays in, into it as well. Yeah, that's, that, is, that is so uh, to the point what you're stating, because the things that we say, it would appear sometimes as if just watching the, the evening news that the only people that are really committing crimes are people are, of, of color. And then it would have seen, it would appear from the outside looking in that there are times in which the sentencing, the sentencing is disproportionate in terms of the same crime and yet one gets probation and one gets incarceration. Um, you know, so, you will also yeah. see this with our schools, unfortunately, if you look at some schools in certain areas, their kids are using drugs too. Their, their yeah. kids are, are, are doing inappropriate things in school, but if that administrator is, instead of calling the police, they mm. handle it, it in house, then that juvenile is not gonna be arrested. But if you are in a school that is over police and that same child has the same marijuana that this other child have in a more affluent area, if that principal or that school district 
have those kids arrested, then it's going to appear that, oh, it's only drugs in the inner city schools. Well, we know very well that that is not true. Right, right. That is so so true. It, it, we, we have to address what's happening in our schools as well. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Judge. Judge, mm -hmm. uh, speaking about attorneys, how does the viewers determine if they have a good attorney, attorney or a poor attorney? What's the litmus so, test? You know, really, when you're dealing with your attorney, I tell people you must remember that you are your own advocate. Even if you have an attorney, you have to speak up for yourself. And so if you have an attorney, and I don't like to paint people with a broad brush, but if there right. is an attorney who is trying to rush you through, who is not discussing the facts of your case with you, who's not going over the offense report with you, you need to pause and, and ask some questions. I'm not yeah. going to call them back. You just need to ask some questions and make sure that you understand every step of this proceeding, because in the end, it is your name on that plea paperwork. It is your name who's going to have to deal. You're the one that's going to deal with the jail sentence or the probation or whatever it is that you're agreeing to. And so if an attorney is rushing you through, maybe they have too high of a caseload, um, maybe they assume that you understand and you don't. Right. And so in those situations, you need to stop, pause and make sure that that attorney is explaining everything to you. What is the recourse for a client who feels as if that the attorney doesn't have my best interest at heart? They're not calling me back. They're not, they're not receiving my calls. Um, we show up in court and it appears if they can't remember my name. And you just feel as if that you're already uh, behind the eight ball per, per se. Uh, what's the recourse? How do you, before you get to the point of signing the documentation, how do you alert someone that, hey, we, I've got a problem over here with my attorney? And so uh, the cases are treated differently if, you're, if your client, if the client has uh, retained the attorney, if they paid the attorney versus if they're appointed by the court. If they're appointed by the court, the judge has some a little more influence there. Okay. If a, okay. a client pays their attorney, they need to refer back to their contract and see how they can, how they're supposed to handle that. If they have issues with their retained attorney, they can always take that up with the bar. They can always bring it up to the judge, but when there's a contract between the two, the judge is not as inclined to get involved with those. A dispute. However, right. if the judge appoints the attorney to represent you, you're always able to request to speak to the judge. If the attorney has not gone over um, any information with you, if there have been several court settings and nothing appears to be happening, sometimes, of course, that can be a misunderstanding because sometimes things are happening behind the scenes and the attorney is just not communicating it well. So you want to make sure um, that, that you are really communicating with your attorney. Um, but if absolutely they're not communicating with you, nothing's happening, you're just signing resets, it seems like your case is stalling, um, then you can always request a bailiff to speak to the judge. I'm always one to listen um, to clients if they say that nothing's happening. And I'll ask questions. I will call the attorney up and get them both together. Right. What's going on with the case? Give, give me the status of the case. Judge Carter, for many of our listeners, they're the first time they've ever heard that you can actually speak to the judge. Uh, what is the protocol for going to speak to a judge? So you would just simply uh, make sure that you're being very polite. I have had defendants who are upset and they come in the courtroom, um, voices raised, tension high. Well, that's not going to be good because my bailiff is going to stop you. Um, yeah. But I would just, if it's a day that your case is set, meaning it's on the court's docket, the judge is already prepared to hear cases for that docket. You just want to let the bailiff know, I need to speak to the judge. Just be respectful. I need to speak to the judge. I'm having an issue. Um, and then you can do it, uh, you know, be patient, wait. And then the judge, most judges that I know will generally um, entertain you that day. Wow, that's, that's good information to know. It did not, was not aware of that. Uh, as you say, other people speaking for you, but an opportunity to speak for yourself. Can you just elaborate for a moment? How does the plea bargaining system work? So a plea bargain is an agreement between the prosecution and the defendant on a punishment. And so it's okay. saying and we're going to trial and in 99% of the cases, they're also waiving their right to an appeal, saying I'm not going to complain about this later. Um, what they're saying is we're going to reach a deal. I'm going to, I'm going to make this offer to you. And, and it means that usually that they're offering less than what they will be requesting at trial. And then if their agreement is a reach, then they would sign the paperwork and they would go before the judge and it must be approved by the judge. So essentially it's just a pre-trial agreement on punishments. Okay. 
what's the advantage or disadvantage of signing off on a plea agreement? Well, the advantage is, as you know exactly what punishment you're agreeing to. If you take a case to trial, um, you don't know what that outcome could be. It could work out in your advantage where someone is found not guilty. Or if you're found guilty and say the judge or the jury is assessing punishment, you don't know what that punishment would be. And so if you reach an agreement, you know, I'm getting two years probation or I'm pleading to two years in prison. It is it's an it helps to be an absolute. The downside is, one, if you're not guilty, you should never enter a plea. Mm -hmm. And the other side is, let's make sure that it's a punishment you can handle. Unfortunately, sometimes we see uh, defendants want to, some, there are some who want to just get this over with, I'll just take a probation. Well, there's a lot involved with probation. You have to meet monthly. You yeah. usually have drug tests. There are gonna be probation fees. Depending on the type of offense, the judge may require some additional classes. And so if you're not really ready for that, you need to you know, be mindful because if you violate, you no longer have a right to a trial. That's what people mm. need to remember about pleading yeah. to say a probation. Your right to a trial is now done. And so if you violate, you there's only a hearing to determine if you violated your probation. That's wow. it. And if they prove in a hearing that you violated your probation, it could be revoked. The judge can sentence you however he or she see fit. So you need to really make sure that you are really ready to make that kind of commitment. But even though it's difficult, I would say doing a deferred adjudication, meaning a not a final conviction, if you have that option, is often better than taking a jail plea because then jail is a final conviction and it's on your record. It's on your record. So oh, make sure you talk to your attorney. <laughs> that's, that's, that's great clarity. Be sure that you're able to handle, uh, the, I guess, the requirements or the, or, or the, the mandates of the probationary period. Um, speaking of record, is it possible to get something off the record, that if you you have a conviction, can you get? I think the word is expungement. Can you get an expungement? So not on a conviction. So expungement okay. is when your case has been dismissed or you've been found not guilty at trial. That's generally when when you see those people okay. get uh, what's called a non-disclosure confused. Okay. So if you sign up for deferred adjudication on certain offenses, meaning that's the plea bargain, that's that type of probation where it's not a final conviction and you successfully complete that, then in some certain cases, you can get it non-disclosed. And so you don't have a final conviction on your record. And so that's deemed not disclosed. Of course, it can always be seen for law enforcement purposes. So if you're ever mm. arrested again, the police can see it, uh, um, the DAs can see it, the judge can see it. Um, it's just not a final conviction. But to get something completely off your record, that is a dis when the case is dismissed. Um, or you're found not guilty at trial. So there's a difference there. So a, if you're convicted, it stays, it's there. Okay. If you're convicted, it stays. Conviction stays. So when you said non-disclosure, is that similar to having it sealed with the record, having the record sealed? Correct. That is more of having it sealed. Yes. But it can be seen. By but it can, it can be seen. And unfortunately, the, the, the way um, our internet is with, with these, there are these private sites that pay for criminal records. Mm -hmm. It is so difficult to wipe everything clean off the internet. You can do a non-disclosure. They'll send it out to DPS and all these other law enforcement agencies. But then there are all these other private companies that purchase criminal histories to sell. So then every time you see it up, you need to ask your attorney to send something to that particular company to have them take it down. So it, it, wow. it unfortunately takes some time to yeah, really get wiped because the internet is just wild. You know, it's just yeah, 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 everything's everything on that, the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's quite laborious. That's a lot of work to do that. It, it, it unfortunately oh. is. And that's why, again, it's so much better to not be in the criminal justice system yeah, yeah, than yeah. You know, <laughs> You know, Judge Carter, uh, you've done a good job of educating us, taking us through the ABC, the criminal justice system, but you've also done a lot of work on criminal justice reform. Can you just share with us a little bit of some initiatives that you're involved in or seeking to launch as it relates to criminal justice reform? Yes, so I've always um, 
wanted to be a part of the solution. It's like how we, we have enough of locking folks up. It's like, what can we do differently, right? And so when I was a prosecutor, I did a lot with uh, mental health diversion. That's an, I've always had an interest in that area. We, ha- we know factually we have too many people with mental illnesses who are in our jails and don't have the resources um, to get out. And so we, we worked a lot on that initiative when I was with the district attorney's office under uh, Brian Middleton. I worked in his mental health division, as well as when I was in Harris County. As a judge, I am our uh, drug court judge. And so that's a diversion program for individuals with substance abuse problems. And so when they complete this program, their case is dismissed in the end. They, they won't have a conviction. And so the goal is to get them diverted from dr- jail, get them in treatment, and then get their case dismissed as a a reward for completing the program. So you go through treatment, then you don't have this conviction on your record because we know with addiction, it becomes a revolving door in and out of our care. And so I really um, am focused on that now. In the future, when we get our COVID backlog over with, I would love to do a similar program for young offenders. We know that some of our young men who are coming through our system just simply don't have the means and the tools in their box to really make that change, right? And we know that some of them really need wraparound services. They need assistance with housing, with job training, substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment. And so what I would like to do is to take some of our younger offenders, younger defendants, and do a closer assessment of their needs and see how can we get them diverted out of our criminal justice system? What tools can we give them at 18, 19 when they're arrested so that we don't see them again when they're 30? That's the ultimate. Yeah, I like that. Wrap around services. That is a great phrase. Uh, yeah. How do we get ahead of in the, in the area of prevention as opposed to just retention over and over again? Over and over. Yeah. Yeah, we have to do oh. something different. Oh, it's just not working. And so it's what, what can we do to catch these folks while they're young yeah. so that they're on a different path? Wow. Judge Carter, I guess my last, my last question for you would be, um, what counsel would you give to our families as it relates to the criminal justice system? How do we explain what should we be explaining? Uh, what conversation should we be having at our own kitchen tables as it relates to the criminal justice system? You know, I like to tell people that our system is not perfect. Um, and the only way that we're going to really get the change that we need is to have people involved, hold our leaders accountable, but also one, stay out of the criminal justice system to the best of your ability, because that getting into trouble is a lot easier than getting out of it, as my yeah, grandmother yeah. used to say. So yeah. let's try to stay out of it. But also let's think about what can we do outside of the system to prevent people from coming in. We are um, having, we've seen just a sharp decline in funding in these underserved communities for extracurricular mm. activities for these kids. Let's give these kids something to do in their downtime, their weekend time. Um, and on summer breaks, I mean, let's make some affordable programs that these kids can be involved in so that they don't have all this idle time and they don't get in trouble and then get in our criminal justice system. Yeah. Let's address some of the things that are going on in our schools. So criminal justice reform can start before you even get to the criminal justice system. Let's look at the globally, the causes of crime, the poverty, the lack of job. The lack of hope, really, that we yeah, see, yeah. In this low self-esteem, this peer pressure, like let's address some of those issues outside of the courts so that maybe we won't have so many people in yeah. court. Yeah. And so we're going to have to think globally about that. And so the biggest thing I always tell kids, don't don't come here. I, I don't want to see you arrested in here. Okay? I don't want to see yeah. you here. But if you do find yourself in trouble, let's find a way to get these kids out and let's think of some ways that we can divert them, that we can deter them from getting here. Um, As adults, you know, we see what worked and what hasn't worked. And so let's try to figure out a way and that we can change, you know, the narrative for our kids and give them some positive examples, you know, give them some positive images and let them see what's possible. Um, If they just set their goals and really focus on where they want to be, and let them know that it is possible. It doesn't matter where they come from. It's possible to get out of your current situation. Amen. Amen, Judge Carter. And and you are proof positive of that. <laughs> because Thank you are you. here. Thank Kitchen you. table, you've heard from the Honorable Judge Tamika Carter yourself. You probably never thought you'd see a sister 
sitting on the bench like this, you being able to have access to her. Judge Carter has, has inspired us, encouraged us, and has thoroughly educated us. I want you to take this and share it with your family, your friends, your loved ones, your neighbors, because we need to know. There's something God wants to do, turn a new chapter in our families. And it begins by getting ourselves educated and equipped and also encouraging one another. So I thank you, Judge Carter, for the time, for being at the kitchen table. And I look forward, audience, to seeing you next Friday right here once again at the kitchen table. May God bless you. May God keep you. And I'll see you soon back at the kitchen table. Bye-bye.